The cool rain splashed down on the carriage roof as it turned another winding corner in the dark, quiet forest. Lord Frankenstein breathed in the crisp morning air as the carriage rattled and lurched forward. He especially loved this time of day, the peaceful bloom of morning when the forest still shrouded in darkness inched towards the light, the air still damp and fresh with the promise of a beautiful sunrise. The horse hooves padded a quiet, steady beat that drummed in his head, keeping time with the beat of his heart. He had just one thought on his mind. Anne-Marie. Fair Anne-Marie. Lord Frankenstein's heart fluttered, and emotion welled in his chest at the thought of what he was about to do. As his mind wandered, he envisions the look of love in her eyes as he kneels before her, her delight rising, bursting out of her when she sees the golden ring upon her finger. He would then sweep her up into his arms, cradle her fair porcelain face between his hands, and whisper, Forever, my love, Anne-Marie. Suddenly the coach lurched, and in just an instant they were tumbling forward, careering along the wet dirt of the path. Before he could shout to the coachman, the carriage came to a thundering halt, aching as it hit the evergreen in its path. The carriage hit the ground with a forceful thud. Lord Frankenstein flung across it with a force only nature could muster before meeting his own abrupt stop. In stunned silence, unable to move, he heard the groaning of men and the cries of horses, and it wasn't until the forest had gone quiet that he felt the raw heat emanating from his side. His fingers traced the side of his ribs until he felt the earthen tree root penetrating the flesh beneath his arm, deep within his chest. As the pain washed over him and his breathing became more shallow, he let his head fall back to see the morning sun creeping across the sky, and in the morning clouds he saw Anne-Marie's beautiful face. And with his dying breath he whispered, Forever, my love. Anne-Marie watched as the day wore on, waiting patiently by her window. But as stars began to poke through the inky sky, something undeniable stirred within her, a deep, restless dread. Bile rose in her mouth, quickly turning sour and bitter as she pushed it down, swallow by swallow. Forever, my love, Lord Frankenstein, she whispered, waiting desperately for the lights of the carriage to fade into view. Time slowed to almost a stop. Days passed before the news finally came, and as they told her, Anne-Marie's eyes were vacant, and without blinking, silent tears slid down her pale cheeks. When the servants had closed the door behind them, she let out a harrowing scream, making them freeze in their place. She clutched her hands to her chest, pain ripping through her heart, bidding it not to break. But then, what was life without him? She would never know, she decided, as she slipped into the silence of the afterlife, and her essence was picked up on the delicate wings of the wind. She would search for him in the long darkness of life after death, for however long it took for her to find him. Forever, my love, forever, my love, you'll be. Sam chugs another mouthful of his American beer, the only reminder of home in this strange place he's come to know as his temporary address, the US Army base in Darmstadt. Thoughts of his homeland cloud his mind as he aches to return to what's familiar, but his country needs him. He was never supposed to stay this long, six months he'd been told. You'll be home just in time to ring in 1978 with your love, they'd said. Before leaving for Germany, he'd made all the necessary arrangements and reserved a table at La Francois, the city's fanciest restaurant. The ring he had found at a local jeweller in Darmstadt the first week of his deployment. It had never left his pocket since, living close to his heart with her photograph. But all that felt like a lifetime ago. Now it is October, and the New Year's Eve he was supposed to celebrate with a proposal has long come and gone. He still has no news about returning home. Sam takes another swig of his beer as he watches the festivities around him. His fellow soldiers loudly enjoy the all-American holiday, All Hallows Eve. And despite himself, he smiles. He thumbs the crumpled photograph in his pocket. Georgina, his beautiful Georgie. It's hard to celebrate when she's so far from him. 
He'd promised himself he'd have fun tonight, though, to help ease this hurting heart. A sweet moment's reprieve from longing for her and the knowledge of obstacles that stand in the path of their reunion. But tonight, tonight is a night for celebration. Halloween. Suddenly, a loud rapping is heard at the door, startling the partygoers over the booming radio. A message from the captain is delivered. Shut it down, ASAP. A disappointed booing erupts from the party and the messenger hurries out the door. And Sam suddenly remembers the castle is not far from their base. And without thinking twice, he shouts over the noise. They can continue the party at the castle. Soldiers cheer as they quickly pack up and Sam's pleased with himself for coming up with the idea. He pushes away the alarming thought that they've just invited themselves to Frankenstein's castle. The place is renowned for being haunted, not only by Frankenstein's infamous creature, but also the tormented ghosts of the family's cursed past. After a brisk walk in the chilling midnight air, they can see the castle towering ahead of them. The place is eerily quiet, and all that can be heard is the heavy footsteps of soldiers' boots. As the partygoers and soldiers pour into the castle, a shiver runs down Sam's spine. This place is definitely the ideal setting for a Halloween party. The air feels damp and cold on his throat, and in his lungs a quiver of something, fear, slinking its way up the back of his neck. Sam realizes he's sweating the sickly sweat of fear rather than exertion. He touches the crumpled photograph in his pocket. Sweet Georgie, how I wish you were here with me. Sam startles when music suddenly bellows through the radio. People laugh joyously as they drink and dance. The castle's stone walls bounce the sound perfectly, the entire castle becoming an ethereal and creepy atmosphere of devotion to the night's celebration. Sam joins the festivities, but he can't shake off this disturbing feeling that's gripping him. He pats his pocket again, reassuring himself that Georgie's photograph and the ring are still there, trying to find peace by remembering her soothing voice. His heart aches for her, for her touch. He knows she's waiting for him, but for how long? The thought almost breaks his heart. Sam feels a gust of wind prickling his neck and he turns around. At the top of the staircase leading to the tower, he suddenly sees her. Georgina? But it can't be. When he blinks, she's gone. Who was that girl? He pushes past the dancing soldiers and wilting macabre-dressed partygoers, making his way to the staircase, rushing to find her. With only a few steps, he's reached the top of the stairs and enters the tower. The space is empty, deserted, with nothing but a small bench next to one of the windows. Sam is suddenly overwhelmingly weary. He sits down on the bench, surprised to find it slightly warm, as if someone has just been sitting there. He looks out over the forest, still shrouded in darkness, and at the horizon he can see the first glimpse of morning. As he drinks in the rising light, he closes his eyes. He sees Georgie, in his mind, reaching for him. His heart swells as he thinks of her. God, he misses her. Sometimes he feels like he misses her so much he could just... (laughs) Suddenly his heart is struck by an intense pain, ripping through him. He cries out, clutching at his heart in agony. He falls off the bench onto the hard stone floor. The ceiling spins around him and his heart races. A vile stench of mold and something rotten, something dead, reaches his nose. He has barely the strength to turn to his side before he vomits. Again, the pain rips through his chest and he cries out, screaming in agony. As he struggles to breathe, the pale apparition appears before him, silent tears sliding down her cheeks. Her angelic but cold eyes stare into his, transfixing him in their gaze. His heart is full of fear at the sight of the ghost, yet he's enchanted by her beauty. Georgina, he splutters, a wet warmth washing up his throat. He knows it isn't her, yet she feels so familiar. With difficulty, he slowly wipes his mouth and sees the crimson blood drip between his fingers. The apparition looks down on him, love sparkling in her eyes. Forever my love, Lord Frankenstein. At once, she is upon him, her deathly cold fingers reaching into his chest and cradling his heart, the vile smell of death once again filling his lungs. 
Outside awaits the peaceful bloom of morning, when the forest and the castle, still shrouded in darkness, will inch towards the light. As the first strands of sun begin to weave through leaves and branches, she takes up his spirit to join hers, as the slow thumping of his heart fades out. From the Ghost Next Door podcast. Should we take that again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sally Chachich and Sarah Matson from the Ghost Next Door. just heard the story of the German Frau of Frankenstein Castle. She is said to have died from a broken heart when she learned her fiancé-to-be had passed away in a terrible carriage accident. She is now haunting the very famous Frankenstein Castle, searching the afterlife for her true love. We would like to welcome Dr. Andreas Westib, a German cardiologist and co-founder of Symphony of Health in Canada. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Westib. Thank you. It's interesting that Germany seems to have quite a few of these ghost stories of women dying from heartbreak and haunting various places. Any idea why this is? Um, I think Germany has a long history of people dying, period. <laughs> it's an old <laughs> It's an old country, I guess, and, uh, you know, the older countries are, the more myths are around and usually buildings are older and they come with, mm -hmm. you know, fantasies of things that happened in the past and maybe documentation over the history is not so great. There's no video, there's no podcast, so they rely <laughs> on, on many other things written down or just stories that were told. So that's number one, and I think that's true for, for every other old country, I think. Uh, think of, you know, Transylvania or so, or, you know, those old uh, mid-European countries. But uh, I'm actually, I, I'm, I wasn't aware of that until uh, we got in contact, you and me, um, that, that that is a thing. Um, stories, ghost stories are so clear, but that, that it's about women um, dying of broken heart in, in the old country. I, I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. And um, you as a cardiologist, what what is the truth about the possibility of dying from a broken heart mm -hmm. like this lady did in the ghost mm -hmm. story? Yeah, it's interesting. So I guess um, quite a few years ago now, um, we started to notice that there are patients that come relatively acutely to, to the hospital, usually, uh, w with a clinical picture that is very similar to a heart attack. So, uh, you know, patients have chest pain, they have shortness of breath, they may have significant uh, arrhythmias and a fainted or even sudden cardiac arrest. And so they would be brought to, usually they call 911 because they do feel very uh, ill at home suddenly and they think, oh man, everything feels and and looks like a heart attack, I better call 911 if they can still. Or if mm -hmm. they fainted at home, the um, family would call 911. They come to the hospital and we would initially all think, oh yeah, this is a heart attack. It's an, a heart attack as in an occlusion of one of the main arteries around your heart, suddenly reducing blood flow to the heart muscle and the heart muscle starts to die. That's what a heart attack is. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, over the last 10, 20 years or so, the, the usual approach to those issues is a coronary angiogram pretty early on, in fact, within an hour or two of the presentation. And we started to notice that the uh, the arteries around the heart actually look pretty good. So there, there was not an occlusion as we usually see it. So what hmm. is going on? That's where we started to recognize, hmm, there's something else here. And um, after a while, I guess we also noticed that there was a very typical pattern of how the heart muscle was pumping in those patients that presented with with this heart attack picture with a relatively normal coronary angiogram. 
but a weird pattern of how the heart was moving, pumping. And so there's something, something else that's causing this. And then it developed over time to initially the name for this presentation uh, was actually Takotsubo. I don't know if you have heard that before or if with your research of broken heart syndrome, uh, oh. what that means. Takotsubo is, the, uh, I think, Japanese word for, a, um, uh, for a, an octopus trap, which used to be in the old days uh, made of clay. And it has a certain shape. And that, that trap, it's called Takotsubo. And that shape resembles what we see on an ultrasound of the heart when they present with this broken heart syndrome. And so it was wow. called Takosubo syndrome. Mm. Um, and then over time, uh, trying to figure out what is the reason for it, turns out that there are theories, and we're still not absolutely certain, in fact, to this day, what's causing this. But it seems that a very high stress hormone level is... Um, probably responsible for this presentation, whether it's a spasm mm -hmm. of the arteries, whether it's a direct damage to the cells, we are, we are not quite sure. So from this Takusubo then, we, we also started to call it stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And from there, we noticed, wait a minute, who is actually presenting here with this Takusubo? Man, it's often elderly or middle-aged or elderly women, not so much 20, 30 years old. Uh, and in my experience, really, it's more like 50, 60, 80 years old. And it seems that something acutely stressful happened to them. So I give you guys an example. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a patient that presented, uh, he, she was in her 70s, fit otherwise, and she was going for a canoe trip with her husband, I don't know, maybe on Glenmore Reservoir here or somewhere, I forgot now the details, and her husband almost drowned. And that stressful event caused a stress cardiomyopathy in her, and she came to mm -hmm. the hospital. And I think that's where this broken heart syndrome actually then comes from, that we really have something that resembles an acute stressful event, your partner dies, your partner almost drowns, or any other, uh, uh, um, you know, a stressful uh, interaction with family members or with a neighbor or, or a car accident, or whatever this acute event was, that's where this now comes from. And so we can call it the broken heart syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo. So then... This uh, story about the lady dying from a broken heart because she experienced this traumatic event of her soon-to-be fiancé dying yeah. isn't far-fetched. That's not far-fetched at all. Uh, I mean, it, it depends maybe a little bit. We don't, again, we don't see that in the younger people. We also don't really know why that is. It is usually middle-aged to elderly, and it's primarily women. I don't think I actually have seen a, a broken heart syndrome in a in a man, to be honest. Uh, I may have forgotten oh. that. But, so it is more, wow. more it seems to be uh, clinically at least more in women. So yes, it is possible that, you know, in the older days where there was, or maybe even 20, 30 years ago, where you weren't aware of this, uh, of this uh, entity, that people died suddenly um, or within a few days of presentation and people thought, yeah, that's a heart attack. But in fact, it was a broken heart syndrome. That's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So do you treat it um, in a similar way as you would treat a heart attack or how do you treat it? Yeah. Yeah. We, we basically the initial assessment in eMERGE, let's say patient comes in with with EMS is basically the same because up to that point, we don't really actually know, is it a broken heart syndrome or is this now like just a classic heart attack? So we treat them very similarly. If they develop heart failure, we treat the heart failure. If they develop arrhythmias, so funny rhythms that could be potentially life-threatening, we treat those the same way. And then usually patients, if they present relatively acutely and ill, they get an angiogram. And we have here in Calgary, we have 24-7 uh, provision of an invasive coronary angiogram and angioplasty. It's a part of uh, the Southern Alberta uh, um, heart attack 
system, so to speak, or treatment. So they get it no matter what the time of the day is or whether it's weekend or holiday. We can do that uh, within a very short period of time. And then we see, is it actually an, a, a classic heart attack where there is an occlusion of the artery? If that's not the case and the presentation fits and maybe if early on, we see on an ultrasound, this pattern looks typically typical to this Takosubo trap. Then we have the diagnosis, basically. But we basically treat them the same way. Uh, maybe if they recover well and then they're being discharged, um, maybe the longer-term treatment for the first year or after the first year is a bit different because, for instance, if someone presents with a heart attack picture, a typical heart attack, we... Um, we give them blood thinners for at least a year, two years, three years, antiplatelets, we call those like aspirin and super aspirin, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And um, because we think that, you know, a blood clot within the arteries was responsible. But for this broken heart syndrome, we wouldn't necessarily do that, for instance, because there was no blood clot in the artery. It's the stress that caused the heart muscle to get haywire. And, and so the treatment might be a little different going forward. But if they had a pretty bad damage to the heart muscle from this event and they are left with heart failure, we would treat them the exact same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. Uh, we've heard that it can be uh, common for people who experience typical heart attacks and need to be resuscitated to claim that while they were uh, dead, so to speak, they had uh, experience with the afterlife or even loved ones that had passed. Have you ever heard of anything oh, like that? N- I have not, but I, I do think that there is those stories are there as well. And yeah, patients report strange things, you know, during those minutes or half an hour or so of resuscitation. Mm-hmm. That that's that's um, I think that's a thing. I'm not mm. sure that we know why that is. You know, the mind is a powerful thing, um, hallucinations uh, to illusions to dreams. So who knows what what's behind that? But I wouldn't be surprised if that's also real, right? It's a mix of memories and, you know, deja vu type things. Um, that's it's, it's hard to understand what the mind is doing in certain circumstances. But I, uh, yeah, I mean, the experience is real for the patient. Whether that means anything is another question. Ah, that's a very science-based response. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and speaking of science-based, in our last episode, um, we interviewed a priest about their belief about ghosts as their role uh, as a spiritual leader. Mm-hmm. As a doctor who have your base in science, we would love to hear about your belief about ghosts and people walking again after mm-hmm. death. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, um, it's a very interesting topic, I think. I certainly believe in science and the physics as we know it. I think I rely a lot on that. Um, but I also under, I also recognize that our science, and if, if we think about maybe the biggest mis, mis, mystery in, in our in, in, on Earth, let's say, is really our universe still. Um, you know, lots is explained on Earth, climate, uh, climate change, weather, you know, the materials, the atoms we have here on Earth. Everything is pretty clear. The solar flares, what they do to our atmosphere, and what, you know, what the ozone hole is and all that stuff. That's pretty clear. But if we go beyond that, we start to struggle a little bit already within our solar system and then certainly beyond our solar system, our galaxy, and then intergalactic space the size of the universe, the observable, the observable universe, and then what's beyond that, there is lots of mysteries still. So <clears throat> get bringing this back to our day-to-day life and what we believe in or what we, what we think we know or not know is that there is probably energies between spaces of atoms or particles that communicate with, with each other that we still don't really understand. Um, And so whilst I don't believe that there is a person like that is half transparent and she floats through my room and that's someone I loved uh, or so, I don't believe that. But I do believe that there are energies or, or, you know, particles, 
electromagnetic waves or whatever you want to call it, that we still don't really understand or don't really know that they are there, but they could interact with us, with our brain, with our body, mm -hmm. and with what we do even. And our our actions may also then influence that particle on the other side of, I don't know, the room uh, mm -hmm. of the other of the other side of that black hole or the end of the universe. I don't really know that. Um, but again, I think that, of course, the mind is a powerful thing. And so for me, uh, it, it's more like um, whatever you can create in your brain is what you see and what you feel and what you, you know, a sensation you have, oh, a cold breeze coming through or, man, I felt the vibration. This can all be internally, right? This is all created by your brain. It would be more likely like that. That's how I see it. Thank you for that response. Fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was uh, wonderful to meet with you today, Andy or Dr. Westib, and uh, and have you share some of your expertise with us. We learned so much uh, <laughs> about broken heart syndrome and how that relates to this fascinating ghost tale. Yeah, thank you a lot for joining us this early morning. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's an honor to, to be invited to that. It was great. Love, lovely. Thank you for listening to The Ghost Next Door. This was episode three of season one, The German Frau of Frankenstein Castle, performed by Sally Chachich. This story is a creative reimagining inspired by the hauntings at Frankenstein Castle, written by Sally Chachich and Sarah Madsen. This episode features an interview with Dr. Andreas Vestib, a specialist in cardiology. You can find us on YouTube and all of your favorite podcast platforms. You can support us by subscribing and follow us on social media at Ghost Next Door Podcast. Our next haunting episode will be released in February 2024.